Welcome to The Brainstorm, episode 82. Frank Downing joining us. Recap of NVIDIA's GTC conference. That is the GPU Technology Conference conference. <laughs> Frank, what happened? What were the big takeaways? I, on my side, I saw GM and NVIDIA partnering, but we, we can circle back to that. What, what was the meat? And potatoes of it. Yes. Um, well, the NVIDIA does two main conferences every year. The one that happens in the spring, usually in March, um, usually they're showing off their hardware roadmap for uh, their data center products. So obviously this was all about AI. And I think notable relative to previous years is the amount of time spent and emphasis on inference uh, rather than training. So when NVIDIA is talking about previous generations of their products and the year-on-year -year performance, uh, it's been, you know, Hopper is four times better at AI training and training really large models uh, like GPT-4 better than um, the prior generation, which was Ampere. Uh, training was barely mentioned, total focus to inference, how can we scale large language models and reasoning models that produce way more tokens than traditional models uh, to uh, billions of users. Um, so they showed off uh, various things on the software side to make that more efficient. They also showed off their kind of longer term hardware roadmap, which um, goes out to 2027 now. The next generation, the current generation is Blackwell. Uh, the next generation is going to be called Vera Rubin. Um, and the long story short of it, we can get into whatever more details you want, is that they are dramatically increasing the density and the number of chips and the amount of computation per rack. They're not even talking about really individual GPU or individual chip specs now. They're talking about, you know, this giant cabinet that's going into a data center and how many chips they're shoving into that. Um, and with this increase in density comes a lot better performance. Um, so they showed just one stat, the Vera Rubin Ultra, which is the 2027 model, is going to be 14 times more um, compute flops available. So theoretical performance than the current generations that are shipping this year. Frank, maybe help those that don't fully understand the difference between training and inference and what you need to happen in the data center to be more efficient on either of those? And who has been in the lead on the training side? Who has been in the lead on the inference side? And maybe just elaborate a bit more about NVIDIA's plans on inference now. Yeah, sure. So at the highest level, training is building your AI model. Inference is running your AI model. And to train these models, actually also to run them, but to train them most effectively, it's really been about scaling out the number of GPUs that can talk to each other coherently um, or basically at the same time without getting out of sync. Uh, so that's what previous you know, GTC conferences have been about, of scaling up the number of GPUs that are talking to each other, kind of the scale out computing. Uh, for inference, rather than using as many GPUs as possible. Um, and to give you a sense of scale out, you know, it, maybe three or four years ago, connecting 256 GPUs together was, was very impressive. It, uh, XAI with their Colossus cluster has 100,000 GPUs talking to each other. So the, the scale out has been tremendous to increase the performance of training. Uh, for inference, and, and both scale out and scale up are relevant, but uh, for both of these things. But for inference, NVIDIA is really focused on kind of scaling up the capacity uh, per chip and in one dense unit, because you're thinking about um, uh, the amount, the minimum amount of hardware required to run one instance of the model. And then you want to run many instances to support different users. Uh, so that's where they're kind of scaling up the amount of compute per rack with uh, memory is one of the most important benchmark uh, uh, metrics, for example. Um, depending on the size of a model, the number of parameters, you basically need more memory per chip to support it or more memory per inference unit to support it. Um, so uh, over the last two or three years, um, AMD has actually had more, really two years, AMD's had more memory per chip than what NVIDIA has offered in their H100 or H200 hopper chips. Um, going into the Blackwell Ultra and Beyond generations, so that's like what's going to ship later this year and into next year, NVIDIA is matching AMD uh, more directly in memory per chip. So that like theoretical inference performance um, will get uh, closer. 
the dip, the key difference here is that AMD's had a memory advantage, which means they should have a performance advantage, but their software stack is much farther behind NVIDIA's because NVIDIA has been doing um, accelerated computing for AI so much longer that the NVIDIA chips, even with worse specs on paper, have performed better in practice. Um, but I know I've been talking for a while. I see you, Sam, about to butt in. But the last <laughs> thing I'll say is that you hear a lot of conversations about the custom silicon startups um, or custom silicon at the hyperscalers or the chip startups like Cerebris, Grok, for example, um, that are really targeting inference specifically and trying to have a performance advantage over NVIDIA. And uh, we think actually both Cerebris and Grok are, are good candidates for having that advantage over the long term. But it's uh, very hard to keep pace with the rate of improvement at NVIDIA. And they're clearly, by focusing the first hour and a half plus on inference of this presentation, uh, combating that directly. And that's Grok with a Q, not a K. Yes. We have to be mindful. But the, the, the interesting thing is, you know, Grok with a K to scale to more users maybe needs Grok with a Q chips to do that. Right. All right. So then that was the weeds of what's going on. Why does it matter? It's like, does, was this, was there anything that they announced that was a surprise or this was like a TikTok, you know, okay, NVIDIA's keeping on, keeping on. And this was the expected and necessary outcome for all of our AI dreams to come true? <laughs> um, I mean, we've been focused on cost declines in AI for a while. We think every year chips are getting better at an extremely fast rate, much faster than Moore's Law. And to keep pace with that, you need uh, either new innovators or NVIDIA to keep innovating themselves. And it's kind of status quo that they're continuing to push the frontier. So that's great to see. It's impressive that there's you, there's not like a plateau or a missed execution, but at the same time, if you just keep drawing a straight line, they're continuing to execute very well. And then um, on the physical AI, I know there was a slide there. What what was that all about? Yeah, I think it's going to, it seems like continue to be a growing focus for NVIDIA, especially as you have more and more hype around humanoid robots and autonomous vehicles. Um, they announced the deal with GM, like you mentioned, which, um, you know, maybe an attempt to reboot autonomous efforts post cruise. Uh, but uh, they also focus probably much more than on autonomous driving on humanoid robots. And they're releasing more uh, open source models and data sets to make the training and fine tuning of humanoid robots uh, easier. Um, so they released a 15 terabyte data set of both real world and synthetic data for um uh, physical movement in the environment that can be used for uh, kickstarting humanoid robot efforts. And then um, open sourced a model themselves called Groot N1. It's kind of an extension of something they previewed last year. Um, that I, I'll ask you a question, Sam, because I don't know if you if you looked at it, but it seemed like a very similar uh, two model uh, and two chip system to what Figure AI showed off a few weeks or months ago. Do you want to explain what that is? Because NVIDIA looks like they're basically trying to open source a similar thing. Interesting. I'll have to I'll have to see the NVIDIA version. The Figure version is Helix, um, and essentially, it's like one is understanding the scene. And that's like one model and chip. And then there's another simultaneous and tied in one, which is like the actual um, control of the robot. And so then it's being able to understand someone saying, hey, Frank, take off your glasses and pass it to me. And understanding what Frank is, what glasses are. Frank, you're great, great humanoid. <laughs> uh, and then tying that in with the you know actual actuation of the hands to grab it and take it. Sam, are most humanoid robot companies that you follow using NVIDIA either software or hardware? Unclear, I would say. And it's like trying to, you know, if someone has used the Unitree humanoid robots and sees this video and wants to tell us what it's actually like, that'd be great because there's lots of videos with varying degrees of potential CGI. Um, and, you know, we've spoken to some people who've claimed to have used the robots, uh, but I'd say, you know, I think more and more we're hearing China on everything AI related uh, and it would be great, great to learn more there. Frank, that brings us next question. Wait, Maybe before we get there, Sam, would you 
say that you are scarred from Boston Dynamic videos in that you don't trust any video you see about no, human. No, I feel I, like I, every time I, I show you or message you on Teams a humanoid robot and I go, wow, you're like, probably CGI. <laughs> That's not, there are some <laughs> videos that look, that you can tell, I would say, are CGI. The Boston Dynamics, not CGI, but very hard coded. Um, and so not generalizable. That's rapidly being solved, right? Like there was a recent video with Boston Dynamics and I forget, I'm blanking on the name of the organization, but they were doing reinforcement learning for walking for the Boston Dynamic robot. And it was very, very impressive. I'm saying, you know, when the, when the video looks all of a sudden going from realistic to like a uh, movie and then I question it. <laughs> I thought that video you're referring to was interesting because that was the first time at least I've seen a video of a humanoid robot do something humans are technically not capable of, as in it twisted its body and maneuvered itself in a way that wouldn't be normal from a human because it has more dexterity and yeah, it's, it's like hips it turns can head upside rotate. down and then yeah, starts walking on it. It looks like a horror movie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's kind of what it was, but it was building something for a, I think it was a car, but I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, let me get one more tidbit that I thought was interesting. And it is part of the NVIDIA story too, which is that um, Jensen said on stage that Waymo is one of the companies, you know, Waymo of Google, and one of the companies that's using um, NVIDIA chips, both in the data center and in the car. Uh, and I think, you know, that had been assumed or rumored in the past, but this, you know, definitely rang through as he emphasized it. And I think it's just interesting because when you look at one of the selling points that um, NVIDIA has been saying is that compared to a CPU, an accelerator or a GPU is more specifically focused on um, AI and parallels parallelizable workloads, but it's still general to an extent. It's not as use case specific as something like Grok with a Q that's really designed to, you know, spit out tokens as fast as possible. And that like is a Goldilocks zone where it's flexible enough to handle different workloads, but not, um, but still much faster than um, a, a traditional CPU. And that Google is one of the only companies that has a scaled internal custom silicon effort with the TPU. And they're using NVIDIA still for both data center and in-car training uh, or in-car inference data center training, I think basically speaks to that strategy really being kind of true, or at least it's been true to date. We'll see if it changes over time, but um, I definitely thought that was an interesting confirmation. All right, Frank, maybe last question here. This, I was trying to do a smooth transition with talking about China into a China question. Nick with his videos. Uh <laughs> I'm just curious. Okay. You um, always seem skeptical about humanoid robots. I'm I, a healthy dose of skepticism. <laughs> I'm, I'm skeptically optimistic. Um, okay. China has been doing a ton with AI open sourcing. That's one element. People saying, okay, does that impact the demand for chips is one. And then two, um, are we just in like the next decade of people buying chips from NVIDIA and it's just up and to the right? Or do you think we hit a cycle and get over our skis in terms of buying hundreds of billions of dollars of chips? Yeah, I think both are true over different time horizons probably. Um, and the timing and depth of a overbuy of GPUs is very hard to predict. Um, I think on the China model side, um, I don't think it destroys demand for chips. I actually think it increases demand. I mean, you now have excitement around generative AI being ignited in China. I think DeepSeek probably started it, but Tencent, Baidu, all these companies have their own chat GPT replica products, and they're all seeing growing demand. And if you listen to their earnings calls, they're all saying they're compute constrained. So they now have demand for a new product. They need chips to power it. So I think that only increases demand um, in the near term. Um, and then, you know, I think the the end point value of AI is so high that everybody's trying to build out and buy as much compute as possible. 
Um, and you see share shifts that, you know, is one example of where somebody can get caught off sides of an individual player versus the industry as a whole. Like there's reports now of Microsoft buying less compute than they would have otherwise. And I think that's directly correlated to uh, OpenAI's, you know, reported restructuring, the ability to access compute outside of Microsoft. If OpenAI, their biggest user of AI compute is now going elsewhere, that means Microsoft needs less capacity. So those are very well tied together. All right. All right. Nice timing. Good timing. All right. We'll see everyone next week. <laughs> see everyone. Thank you.